Ga je er recht op gaan. Good morning friends, I am G. S. Suresh from NIE teaching you design of RCC structural elements. We had two classes earlier in the introduction to the design of RCC structural elements. I have so far taught you about the reinforced concrete. I have defined the reinforced concrete. It is a concrete reinforced with bars on the tension side. Concrete is a material manufactured using cement, aggregate, water and admixture. So, if you make a mixture of this, you will get a solid material which is equivalent to a stone, which is very good in compression and weak in tension. That is why we use wherever the tensile stress occurs, there the reinforcement. And the reinforcement generally in reinforced concrete structure will be in the form of bars. They are called as rebars. High strength steels are generally used and we use the guidelines of Indian standard code IS 456 for the design and the construction of reinforced concrete structure. The reinforced concrete stru structure should resist the load acting on it. And the load is nothing but the forces acting on the members. These forces can be classified as dead load, live load, wind load, snow load, earthquake load and these loads are considered on the structure and we find the internal forces developed like bending moment, shear force, axial force and torsion using the analysis of structure. For the design of RC structure, we use a concept called as limit state design. I had given an introduction to limit state design in the previous class. I said the limit state design is a probabilistic method which we have learnt in our mathematics. I had defined what is the characteristic load and the strength. It is the load which we increase from the actual load by multiplying a factor and this is to take care of the uncertainties developed in the material. Because you manufacture this concrete in the field, you are not able to control the quality. To take care of this, we define the characteristic load as the load which in about 95 percent of the life of the structure will not exceed this. And we have defined the partial safety factor used in the design and we, we had given different theories of limit state. I had talked about the working stress method and about ultimate load theory and also I said we require the stability analysis to take care of overturning and this provides a rational basis. Today's objective is to learn more about the limit state design and then we will go to unit 2 in which we are going to learn general aspects of the ultimate strength. So, now let us uh, continue the previous class. The probabilistic analysis and design was defined in the earlier class, same has now been repeated. Safety margins are provided in the design to safeguard against the risk of failure. So, we have to take care of the load so that the beam is assumed to collapse. Then you find out what is the collapse load, apply a suitable factor and bring it down. That is the probabilistic method we use. Loads and material property varies, varies randomly as I have already told you in today's beginning of the class. Probability of a cert, uh, certainty is m divided by n. m is the number of certain events happening out of n events. Say out of uh, 20, there could be 15 events happening. An example is, I say I have casted about 100 beams. Out of the 100 beams, at least 95 percent of the beam has got a particular strength, that is the probability. The variation in strength of material and in loads are analyzed using statistical techniques. Today, I am going to teach you some of the statistical concepts which you have learnt in your mathematics. 3 and 4, 
the same will be used here to calculate what is called as characteristic load. The data available regarding the strength of the materials or load are tabulated in the particular range. Say for example, I have casted a cube, you know what is a cube is? The concrete cube generally recommended by the code is having sides 150 mm. This cube is used to find the compressive strength of the concrete. The 28th day strength of the concrete generally we denote as the grade of concrete. So, for that we conduct several laboratory tests. Say for example, I take 3 samples having the strength in the range of 15 MPa to 17 MPa out of 100 samples. Then I say the frequency in this range is 3 by 100 equal to 0 0.03. Using this frequency and the strength I draw a graph like called as histogram. You must have learnt in your high school days how to plot this histogram. The table next slide shows how is the frequency. You can see here between the range of 20 to 22.5 there is a number of observation is 1. So, I have calculated the frequency. Like that I have made from 20 to 45 what is the number of observations I have made. You can see the most of the observation is between 30 and 35 and I have given the frequency. If I plot a graph like this, this is called as histogram. Friends, you can see here, this is the range between 20 to 22.49, the frequency is 0 0.025. So, in this graph, I am having the frequency in the y axis and the strength range on the x axis. So, this histogram shows you how the variation is there. As I said, between 30 to 35, the range is more. If you plot the center of these plots of the histogram, you get a smooth curve. This curve is called as probability curve. When the number of observation is increased and I bring down the frequency, naturally this rectangular vertical columns will become a curve like what I had shown in the previous slide. And this distribution curve is called as probability distribution curve. You can see here, I use the term now instead of frequency, probability density index f x in the y axis and I have got the observation values which is very close in the x axis. I get a smooth curve like this, like it is a bell curve and between the two ranges of x1 and x2, the area gives you the probability of occurring the values between x1 and x2. So, I have said same thing in this slide and now I define some of the statistical terms as you have studied in your earlier class of mathematics. You know what is a mean is, I call it as sample mean. It is the sum of the values in the range of i equal to 1 to n divided by n, where n is the total number of samples. This is mean, this is nothing but average what we have taught to you. The same thing is mean and you know about this very well. Then I define the variance. The sample variance is equal to sigma squared. Sigma is called standard deviation, which is taken as summation of the individual value minus the mean value whole squared, you sum it up and then divided by the total number, which gives you sigma squared or I can call the standard deviation as square root of this expression. That is summation of x i minus x bar whole squared divided by n. And what is the variance? Coefficient of variance is standard deviation divided by x bar is nothing but the mean into 100 percent. This gives me how much variation is there in my sample. And now I plot a different curve similar to 
the probabilistic curve which is called as Gaussian distribution curve having the curve equation given by y is equal to 1 by sigma e to the power of minus 0.5 x minus x bar whole squared by sigma squared. If I call z as x minus x bar then I can write the same thing as 1 by sigma into e to the power of minus 0.5 z square. So, here the z is a constant that is all it is x minus x bar. I have replaced the x by z in the x axis and I have plotted on the x axis and I have plotted y by taking the value from the previous equation in the y axis. The range of the z is between minus infinity to plus infinity. So, this is a standard probability curve. So, friends you have know this in your mathematics very well and uh, this shows you how we can use this for our design of RC structures. I make my structure to ha have a particular variable value between two ranges which will have z equal to 1.64 times sigma such that the probability of the occurrence in the life of the RC structure is about 90 percent. This is called as level of confidence. So, the probability of that is not occurring is only the 5 percent which is the area 0.05. So, using this we will try to understand how we calculate the different concepts in RCC design. Between the two values of z equal to z 1 and z 2 the area is represents the probability. The total area of this curve which I showed you earlier is having an area equal to unity. About the center y axis it is having a symmetrical curve about left and right of the y axis. So, this I can say if you consider one side and determine the area if you multiply by the 2 you get the total area. This area between the two values or the value in the y axis for a particular value of z is given in this table. This is available for you in any bookstore or in almost all the textbook of mathematics or in the textbook of reinforced concrete design. The table in the first column shows you z. So, how to read this? Say for example, it is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 and in the 0 column that gives you 0 0.0398. If you want 0 0.11 then come to 0 0.01 this gives you the value of 0 0.0438. Like that if it is 0 0.19 you take the last column in this row it is 0 0.0753. Another example I will give you 0 0.68. So, take the 0 0.6 and go to 0 0.08 in this you will get the value of the z, a, a z value is 0 0.2517. So, like this for the z of 0 0.608 the area is 2, 0.2517. So, how to use this I have given an example here. Find the probability that is the area under the curve for z 1 equal to 0 0.63 and z 2 equal to 1.44. How do we calculate this now? For z 1 equal to 0 0.63 go back to the previous table here 0 0.63 you can see here it is 0 0.2357. For z 2 equal to 1.44 so, that is it is not available in this uh, particular slide you can see in your uh, book or in the table available to you there it is 0 0.4251. So, deduct the two values 0 0.4251 and 0 0.2357 you get 0 0.1894 that is the area with the probability we can state that it is 18.94 percent. So, this is how you use to find the probability of what can happen between the two range. Using this concept I define the characteristic value 
a characteristic value is the one in which the probability of occurrence is 95 percent and only 5 percent is not there. For that I get a value of the z as 1.64. So, that is we can say that the curve lies between 0 to 1 minus 1.64. Hence, I define the characteristic strength of a material as x k characteristic strength equal to mean x bar minus 1.64 times sigma that is standard deviation. So, whenever we use the material we use minus sign, whenever we use the load we use the plus sign. So, always my mean value should be more than the x k value. So, that is how I calculate the characteristic load also as x bar plus 1.64 times sigma. So, from this we can understand that the probability of failure can be predicted using the distribution curve for load. The probability for this load is greater than the resistance. So, let us try to apply some of this what I had taught you about the probability concept that is the statistics concept into some example. First example is stating the problem like this. A set of concrete cube strength are normally distributed with a mean of that is x bar equal to 30 MPa and standard deviation sigma equal to 5 MPa. Determine the probability of a random cube having the strength between 35 and 40 that means I have to find the value of x. But friends remember I know the value of z in the probability curve and I have defined what is z in the curve that is x minus x bar by sigma using this I will find out the x value. Similarly, the second part of the problem states that determine the range in which we would expect the strength to fall with a probability of 99 percent. So, let us try to solve this part A before that the data given already I have told you x bar is 30 MPa, standard deviation sigma is 5 MPa. So, I want to find out what is the probability area for x equal to 35. So, I calculate z, z is calculated as x minus x bar divided by the sigma value, sigma is 5. So, z for x equal to 35 gives you 1, for x equal to 40 z is given as x is 40 minus the mean value 30 divided by 5 equal to 2. So, friends now for these two z values 1 and 2 you find the area from the table. For z equal to 1 the area is 0 0.3413 and for z equal to 2 area is 0.477. Therefore, the difference of these two gives you 0 0.1359. Therefore, the probability of occurrence of the cube strength between 35 and 40 is 13.59 percent. This is pure mathematics. So, let us go to the second part of the problem. I want to find the value of x for the probability of 99.9 percent. That means, I want an area 0.999. To one side of the curve, it is half of this because the total area is 1, half the area is 0.5. So, I take the half the area that is 0 0.99 by 2 which is 0 0.4995, z equal to 3.3 from the table. So, using this z I find out the value of x as x bar plus or minus z into sigma. So, 30 plus or minus 3.3 .3 into 5, 3.3 is the z value friends which I have found from the previous computation. So, I get the value of x as 30 plus or minus 16.5. Therefore, the x is in the range of 13.5 to 46.5 to get a probability of 99.9 percent. 
So, that was very simple problem you can expect such problem for 5 marks it is very easy to compute you work out again you get a lot of such uh, problems from the book on Hedge by Hedge Shah on reinforced concrete. So, let us see the second example in this we have a similar problem a set of test results has a mean strength of 27.8 and standard deviation as 4 MPA determine the 95 percent confidence limit the limit of x and x 1 and x 2 the strength limit at 5 percent level of significance and the strength below which 5 percent of the test result may be expected to fall. So, once you calculate for A, B and C is very simple. So, the data given for this is same x bar is 27.8 MPA, sigma is 4 MPA. The limit of Z such that the area is 0 0.95 or 0.475 on one side. So, from the normal distribution table for 0.475 work back you get 1.96. So, it is the reverse way friends you have to do it earlier for a given value of z you are calculating the area. Now, look at the area find out where 0.475 is available in the table and then move in the row to the first column there you get the z value. So, if you have the table you can check this the 95 confer confidence limit is expressed as x equal to x bar plus or minus z into sigma. So, 27.8 plus or minus 1.96 into 4 which gives 27.8 plus or minus 7.84 the range is 19.96. So, like this we can calculate B and C is on the same basis. So, I hope you, it is uh, self explanatory I will not waste time in explaining you this. Now, I will take another concept in the limit state method which is called as partial safety factors. These factors are necessary to take care of the characteristic value that is particularly load into the design value if you multiply or divide for the load and the material you get the design value. It is similar to factor of safety which we are doing in elastic analysis. Here we multiply for the load and we divide for the material and we should take care of this to overcome any possibility of overloading. The structure is designed with the loads obtained by multiplying this characteristic load with a suitable factor of safety which I have already told you and depending on the type of the loads the code gives you this characteristic uh, or the partial safety factor. We represent the partial safety factor for the load as gamma f as I have shown there. So, I calculate the design load f t as characteristic load f into partial safety factor gamma f. So, this value of gamma f for different load is given in table 18 of IS 456 which is been shown here for your reference. Generally most of the structure ex except uh, a tall building you take the dead load and live load for that you have to use the partial safety factor as 1.5 that is in the limit state of collapse. For limit state of serviceability all the values are 1.0. Here students this W L indicates the wind load or you can also use there the earthquake load E L. For that what are the values you should take? So, I told you in the previous class hold the IS 456 code with you when you sit in this class you will understand this better. So, now you open the code and see this in the chapter 3 second page after this chapter 3 opens there you can see this table. 
the characteristic strength of material as obtained from the statistical approach is nothing but the characteristic value which in which we say that not more than 5 percent of the test results are expected to fall outside this. This characteristic strength may differ from sample to sample. Therefore, we use a term called as the partial safety factor gamma m to be multiplied in the denominator. That means to say f d is equal to f c k divided by gamma m characteristic strength of material is f c k and divided by the uh, gamma m. This uh, block diagram shows how the partial safety factors are taken one for the load one for the material this is gamma f this is gamma m and I told you we use this for the factor of safety to multiply the load and here we divide for the material characteristics by gamma m this is f c k is equal to f into gamma m. Class 36.42 of IS 456 states that this partial safety factor for material should be 1.5 for concrete and 1.15 for steel. So, whenever I use the concrete strength I divide by 1.5 Whenever I use the characteristic strength of steel, I divide by 1.15. But if you are using the limit state of serviceability, we are not going to use this value. We are going to use the value as 1. So, here it is uh, very worth mentioning that partial safety factor of steel is comparatively lower than the concrete because the reinforcement is manufactured in factory and concrete is manufactured in site. So, the quality assurance is not there in concrete as much as we get in the steel that is why the value is more for concrete. The test results obtained on the cube is used as the characteristic strength, but the concrete in structure has different size to take care of this we use another value 0 0.67 as a multiplication factor for this characteristic strength. So, whenever I say the concrete in a beam is subjected to compression, I call it as 0 0.67 FCK and not FCK because of the difference between the value obtained in the cube and actual value in the structure. And then the design strength 0.67 FCK divided by gamma m gives you 0.446 FCK. So, the design strength of the concrete so much it has reduced almost 50 percent more than 50 percent is reduced and 0.446 FCK is the maximum strength of the concrete in the stress block. A stress return across the cross section is called stress block. So, with this uh, introduction and two problems I have given you a brief introduction to the limit state designed by probability and statistics. So, all this for the last two and a half days I have covered the unit one of the syllabus given to you in your VTU syllabus. Now friends I will go to unit two. In the unit two the title is principles of limit state design and ultimate strength of RC section. So, the first part of this I will teach you the general aspects of ultimate strength. So, from now onwards you will start understanding the design concept. Before we understand the design concept we have to study the behavior of the RC beam. The members in a structure may be subjected to axial force like in column, it will be subjected to flexure like in beam or may be in column. Shear, torsion or combination of these forces can occur in any member. Where do I get the values of these forces from your structural analysis? Maybe by method of moment distribution method slope deflection method or matrix 
structural analysis we have been able to find the internal forces by these methods. So, let us try to understand how we can design this. The flexural member like beam and slab are subjected to bending moment, shear and torsion. These member deflect and crack and for a RCC member as I have been telling you right from the first class, there must be a perfect bond between concrete and steel, so that the composite material behave as like a homogeneous material. Members are primarily designed for flexure and then checked for shear torsion. Generally, this is the concept we do. In the elastic theory for homogeneous material, we assume the stress is directly proportional to strain. But in case of concrete and the composite of concrete and steel, it is not so. The stress strain curve if you observe right from the beginning of the loading starting from 0, the variation is nonlinear. So, the elastic design method which I told you in the earlier class as working stress method cannot be used for a better prediction of the behavior of reinforced concrete member. Study of the behavior under ultimate load has been found to be more practical and also more useful and this was adopted in 1964, but this method did not take care of the deflection that was replaced by limit state method. So, let us try to understand how a beam behaves under four point loading. Sometimes this is also called as two point loading. You can see these two are the supports and I have two point loads say at a distance of A from the supports at equal distance from left and right support. And the cross section of the beam is having a width B and H as the to overall depth and I place say three bars. I told you the bars are in the form of a circle that is a solid round bar. Here I have shown just for explanation three bars to the center of the reinforcement to the compression zone. It is a simply supported beam. So, the top fiber will be under compression, bottom will be under tension this distance is called as effective depth and the distance from the tension side to the center is called as effective cover and total area of steel is called as AST. And in the beginning when you apply the load from 0 in a small increment of load, the stress is having a stress strain relation straight line in a very small load till the concrete cracks at the bottom of the beam that is in the tension zone. So, this stress strain diagram is linear and the strain diagram is also linear. The strain is epsilon and the stress here I indicated as F. Now, I further load and I find that crack starts appearing. In the initial stage of cracking, it is only below the reinforcement and at that time the stress strain curve is still linear, but tension side there is no stress at all because all the stress is taken care by the steel. So, this is the stress in concrete. Further you load crack to start developing like this, they are called as flexural cracks and further loading shows some inclination of the crack by almost 45 degrees, they are called as shear cracks, they come up to the neutral axis. Almost at this stage, we say that the beam has reached its ultimate stage and the stress strain curve you can see from here is almost parabolic and the stress is F u or F c u you can call and the strain is epsilon c u. 
further loading crack will start propagating towards the compression zone and finally the concrete fails due to crushing of concrete. So the same thing whatever I have explained is given here in this slide up to about 50 percent of ultimate load an initial stage after cracking stress and strain relationship is linear and then it becomes non-linear. Further increase in load to ultimate value induces stress strain to behave like non-linear I have already told you. Finally, when it fails due to crushing of concrete on the compression side is called as secondary compression. When the steel first reaches its ultimate value with respect to its stress and then the concrete reaches its value further loading the section is called under reinforced section. An under reinforced section is a section in which the quantity of steel is small or is such that first the reinforcement reaches its ultimate value that is called yield strength before the concrete reaches its ultimate value. If both the concrete and steel attain their maximum value simultaneously it is called balance section. The other way if the concrete reaches its first ultimate value and the steel later reaches such section is called over reinforced section. In over reinforced section the failure takes place first due to crushing of concrete which is brittle and sudden it is not ductile the steel will not yield at that time. The idea of providing the steel is to make the structure ductile that is sufficient deflection can be observed before it fails but if it does not happen then the beam is not ductile so we will say that over reinforced section or more dangerous wherein we can have the brittle or sudden failure. IS code stipulates that never design a section to be over reinforced. In other words I can tell you do not unnecessarily put more steel. Many non-engineers have a feeling that if I put more steel into concrete our members are strong it is not true you have to provide the steel such a way that the beam will not be over reinforced it should be under reinforced. When the beam is reinforced in tension zone only then it is called singly reinforced section. If you provide the reinforcement due to the reasons which I will tell you later in the compression zone also such beams are called as doubly reinforced sections. Now I will show you a video wherein we had made a test in the laboratory on a reinforced concrete beam and how this beam behaves under the loading is shown here. I have made a fast uh, run of this because it takes long time about 25 minutes to complete this structure. Now you can see it has got the cracks and it has started failing you can observe the deflection there. In this you can see the shear cracks which are appearing on the structure these are all the three different beams which I have subjected to you can see these are all called as shear cracks and these are all called as the flexural crack. So breaking time was almost 32.4 so that is why I have made this as a fast forward and I have shown you the cracks how it appears. In this you can see how the secondary compression takes place the failure takes place in the beam. Now start observing it is deflecting the cracks have appeared here and cracks have appeared here. Now you can see this concrete will break at this point it will crush due to secondary compression. Now you can see it has started spalling out and you can see how it has failed. 
So this is under reinforced section. Unfortunately, I do not have any video to show you the over reinforced section. So you can see how much the deflection has taken place and this is just an indicative of how a beam behaves under the two point loading. So friends, so far I have taught you about the limit state method and I have shown you what is the probabilistic methods. I will just go back and show you how we can use these concepts for our design. So if I recall what I had taught you about the probability of the concrete strength. So we will go back to example 2 and try to recall how we calculated the characteristic strength. I had skipped the part B and C of the problem 2. I will show you again how we can calculate this with respect to the strength limit at 5 percent level of significance and the strength below which 5 percent of trust results may be expected to fall. So you can see the limit of this I had taken x between 19.96 and 35.64. The strength limit at 5 percent level of significance is nothing but the limit outside which 5 percent of the test result can be expected to fall. Hence the limit is 19.96 and 35.64. And you can see here, this is the probability curve which I told you is a bell shape curve. This is the CO, the center line. Here we call this as the minus side and this side is the plus side. And half of this area is 0.5 and this area is 0.5. If I want an area of point or 5 percent below which I want to see, then the area becomes 0.05 then it is the blue hatched portion here you can see that is AB. So I have to deduct this and get the area of ABCD or ABCO at a distance of Z from O. The value of Z such that the area beyond AB is 0.05, then I want the area of ABCO to be 0.95. So, if it is half of this, then it should be divided by 2, it is 0.45. So, from probability table, z equal to 1.64 I get for 0.45. This is nothing but the same characteristic strength which I told you, which is the strength required is 27.8 minus 1.64 into 4 is the standard deviation which is called as 21.24 MPA. Using this, we calculate the characteristic strength. On the board, I will show you how we calculate the field value. Suppose you are in the field engineer and you are required to test at least 4 cubes. The IS456 states that the acceptance criteria for the cubes you have tested should be having, say for example, I have 4 cube values written like this. One value is 16.7, another is 19.7 and another value is 21.5 and another value is 22. Friends, the code stipulates like this. You should have x value to be the mean of this that is x bar, then plus or minus 1.64 times sigma or it state that not uh, z, it is sigma where sigma it states that you take if, if the statistics is not available, you take it as 4 MPA. 
So, taking this say the range will be for if you want to design a M20 concrete according to the code, you should have the strength of the cubes to be ranging from 16 MPa to 24 MPa. If the value is in this range, then you can accept that cube strength or the batch of the cubes and individually it should never go less than the value of 16 MPa. Any one of this if it is less than 16, you reject that batch, you do not allow the concrete to take place. So, this is called as acceptance criteria given by the code. So, now we shall also make how we calculate the characteristic strength from the set of tables. Suppose I have 40 cubes and I want to find out how, what is the characteristic value of this. So, take all the values of the cube strength and find out the mean. How do you find the mean of this? Sigma x i is equal to is i equal to 1 to n divided by n where n is equal to number of samples that is 40. Find out sigma from the equation square root of x i minus x bar whole square sigma divided by n. This gives you sigma value. Then from this you find out the characteristic strength as x bar plus or minus 1.64 times sigma. This is how you calculate the characteristic strength from the field data. You must have calculated the or you must have tested 40 cubes. This is how you do it in the lab. So, again I will tell you about how we have to use the partial safety factors for the loads. This is about the characteristic strength, but now I talk about the characteristic load. We cannot make the characteristic load to be observed in the field. We have to take from IS 875. I told you there were many investigators who have seen the actual structure and they have arrived at what should be the load to be considered for applying that is called as the working load. In this case, we determine from the actual measurement in the building and we do it. But the code IS 875 part 1 to part 5 gives you the dead load, live load, wind load, snow load, etcetera. So, taking that I will calculate the that is the working load. I calculate the design load as 1.5 times the dead load and 1.5 times the live load. If you club the wind load for this, it should be 1.0. If you are calculating the deflection or crack width, do not use 1.5, use 1.0 as I have shown in this table. When you are using dead load and wind load, then you have to use 1.5 or 0.9 and do the both the calculation for dead load separately and take 1.5 for the wind load. If you are considering all the three loads, dead load, wind load and the live load which is written here as IL which is nothing but imposed load. For all the three, you take 1.2, but for deflection, you take for impa, uh, imposed load and the wind load as 0 0.8 and for dead load 1. You can see the notes here friends, this is given in IS 456, while considering the earthquake effect, substitute earthquake load for wind load. For the limit state of serviceability, the value of the given in this table are applicable for short term effects only. What do you mean by short term and long term? 
the deflection which takes place immediately after applying the load is called short term deflection. The deflection happening over a long time, what is that long time? As you know the concrete due to sustain load has got a effect called creep and shrinkage effect and this is taken into account in the long term deflection. Hence, this value is to be considered when stability against overturning or stress reversal is occurring that is the par, that is 0 0.9 where it is written for the dead load in the second row to be considered. So, with this I try to conclude before I, that I will take up the summary of what we did in today's class. So, I will go to the summary. In limit state method, we have the concept of probability that the structure will not become unserviceable in its lifetime. We say that the probability that it fails is only 5 percent, the probability it is safe is 95 percent. The structure should withstand ultimate load and should also satisfy serviceability requirement such as deflection, crack and vibration. And in the limit state, in the yesterday's class I had told you, if you multiply by a factor of safety to the material that is to get the resistance, it is greater than the sum of lambda times L i that is partial safety factor for load for each type that is live load, dead load, wind load etcetera you multiply sum it up the resistance should be more. Here this partial safety factor I said we are going to divide by either 1.5 or 1.15 for concrete and steel respectively. So, mu is less than 1 and lambda is greater than 1 and when we are calculating the deflection we say that delta by L that is the deflection to the span should be less than or equal to 1 by alpha where alpha is the integer number generally we take this as 250. Limit state method uses what is called as characteristic load and strength. Today's class I have introduced you characteristic strength and the characteristic load and also partial safety factor. The members are generally designed for flexure and checked for other forces and I have showed you a video for the behavior of the beam under two point loading. At the initial stage the stresses are linear before the concrete cracks that is the stress strain curve is linear here, but after the cracking it becomes non-linear and for a small strength of the concrete that is about 10 percent of the compressive strength this crack occurs. In under reinforced section the stress in steel reaches its yielding value and yielding of steel occurs crack widens and deflection increases, the beam fail due to cr crushing of concrete. This is a very safe method of designing the beam as under reinforced because you will have sufficient time to evacuate a structure or the people under the structure and this failure is called secondary compression. Very difficult to make a balance section, but it is defined as the section in which the stresses in concrete and ten, uh, steel reaches their value ultimate value simultaneously. Over reinforced section compressive stress reaches its value in concrete the ultimate value and it fails suddenly and this is a brittle failure. With this friends I hope you have understood the behavior of RCC beam today have a nice day next week I will teach you how to start the analysis of a singly reinforced section. Good day. Thank you.